pilot that's in South Wales? Are yeah. there results from it? Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's not a pilot. It's a it's a full it's a fully integrated program, um, and they've evaluated certain components of it. They haven't evaluated from the standpoint of does this service provision model work. What they've done is they've said, um, is this the best way to provide X kind of healthcare service to women or to offenders in the community or to ment meet the mental health needs of males behind in, in in prison. So they've looked at components of it and they're adjusting it. Uh, but the real beauty of what they've done is they've said, we're not going to have the discussion anymore about the contest between security and health care. We're going to say that prisons should be prisons and that health care should be delivered by health providers. And so they, they've created a, a standalone entity to do that. Okay. Um, Liz, yeah. Um, thanks for your comment about prison being a blunt instrument for managing complex social problems. Um, I wish the room was filled full of politicians because I think a lot of this is a political problem. Um, I heard on the radio on CBC last week um, uh, a doctor talking about um, the problem, uh, the looming problem of managing um, elderly people suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's. And he kept saying, we understand that there are only limited health care dollars. We understand there's only limited health care dollars. And it struck me at the time that I have never heard anybody say, you understand there are limited criminal justice dollars. There just seems to be an endless pot of money. Um, and the more we criminalize social problems, um, uh, the more a correction system is expected to be all things to all people. And I think that's unfair for the people who work there. Um, um, do you have any suggestions for how we might be able to raise this politically and say, um, you know, we would like to reverse that trend and say there's limitless money for health care in communities so that we can deal with these problems in the communities before they're swept into the criminal justice realm and that there are limited criminal justice dollars by which um, we can have uh, problems that do have to go to that area. You know I don't talk politics. <laughs> Uh, but 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 let me say this about that. <laughs> the the, the, uh, the the there is in fact a very finite pot of criminal justice dollars. Um, there's lots of rhetoric around we'll spend as much as we have to to keep the streets safe. But the reality is is that there aren't the resources equal to the rhetoric. Um, so I think the, 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 the key political message needs to be where are we likely to find the most value for the investments that we do make. And that's well beyond the Correctional Service of Canada. In fact, the Correctional Service of Canada is on the receiving end of a lot of bad decisions and then has to make the best out of it. Um, so the political discussion is really about what is the role that we really want government to play when it comes to dealing with all of those things that we know contribute to people get, becoming into conflict with the law. And leaving those correctional dollars to be spent as the last resort that they were intended to be. And I think that that's the kind of discussion, if I was going to talk politics, that I would encourage you to have. Yes, sir. West Coast Genesis Society, Michael Batty and Gordon Thompson. We run a CRF, uh, agency of CRFs. Okay, can you just uh, tell us what a CRF is? Sorry? Can you tell us what a CRF oh, is? Okay. Thank you. And first off, I just want to give you accolades. It's not often that being the correctional investigator to see such passion in the way you presented your presentation. And as one of the things is, seeing your passion, but then seeing all the things that you recommended, without including the things that require a dollar amount. Of the things that you recommended, what are the things that you could tell us that we are able to initiate some kind of change, becoming uh, change uh, negotiators that would help reduce some of the barriers to those recommendations? You've got a young demographic of really inspirational students here that uh, are the future of what you're talking about. Give us some thoughts on that, please. Boy, of all of the tough questions, um, you know, I, 
I, I have a couple of thoughts. I'm not, I'm not sure they're going to actually going to be equal to the task you just set out. But, you know, I, I had a meeting with um, the director of an occupational health program at a Canadian university. And the question she asked me, she said, how come, they, how come in your business you guys don't use a lot of occupational therapists? Like, do you know what these people are trained to do and how they do it and the kind of value they can add to, to, to the work that you do and the kind of bridges they can build? And the reason why I, I, I use that as partial response to your question is that I think for too long we've, we've felt that it's our business and nobody knows our business but us. And we've really forgotten that what we're talking about are human beings. And, and so, so there, there are a, a range of other interveners out there. And um, I, I, I think the way to break down the barriers to, is, is literally to break down the barriers, is to invite them to the table. Um, and don't wait for them to invite you. And um, I, I, I've actually seen that work. When, you know, there, there are communities right across this country where you have one or two inspirational leaders who manage to bring disparate elements together and magic from program perspective happens. Very hard to replicate that across the country. In fact, the death knell of many of those programs is when somebody says, oh, this is a best practice, and now we're going to try to do it everywhere, because you don't have those inspirational leaders everywhere. But you certainly have the opportunity to bring together those various perspectives. Um, being a halfway house operator means you have to have a relationship with your community. So you've got to have, you should have advisory councils, and I'm sure you do. And those advisory councils will tap you into other community opinion leaders. And those community opinion leaders will have a whole variety of ideas. Um, and so keeping the conversation alive is critical. And um, advice to CSC is to do it with the lights on and the door open. Uh, Correctional Services Canada is a very defensive, monolithic organization. And um, they're getting better. And you can help them. Okay. Yes, sir. Are there currently any uh, mandatory psychological reviews for inmates who have been moved multiple times in segregation? I'm going to think very carefully about that. I, th I think the answer is, okay, the question is, are there mandatory reviews based on somebody, mandatory psychiatric reviews based on somebody who's been placed several times in segregation? There are mandatory reviews and there are visits by health care, but there's not a mandatory review based on the number of placements in segregation, psychiatric review placed on the number of, uh, yeah, uh, based on the number of placements. Madam? Um, you mentioned that there are some new recommendations that sound wonderful. You know, um, I, I've been, I've been uh, nipping around the corners of this business for a long time. And that discussion has been a constant part of my experience in working in the criminal justice system about what it is or is not that society will tolerate and what are really community values around these things. What I've learned is this, is that Canadians as a whole have a tremendous capacity for compassion in the abstract. Um, and that, and that it's very difficult to apply that um, in, 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 your, in your own, you know, in your own immediate experience if you're feeling threatened. 
So the, so the way to deal with that is to try to remove the threat. And the threat's not necessarily the person who's acted out violently. The threat is, is that there was nothing put in place to prevent that or to assist the prevention of that from happening in the first place or again. Um, what I'm talking about has got nothing to do with being soft or hard on crime or criminals. What I'm talking about is balancing an appropriate and effective response, maintaining the dignity of the human person, having a human rights lens around what it is that we believe needs to be done to protect ourselves as a society, because protection and public safety are certainly issues. Um, and I think that there, are, that, the, the, that there is every opportunity and every reason to believe that, yes, society will accept that kind of an approach. Um, I can tell you that when my office releases a report, as we did around the death of Ashley Smith or Martin Blackwind or Alan Nicholson or others, um, sure, we get, we get a few messages saying, who cares? Let them kill themselves or kill each other. It's, you know, fewer mouths that we have to feed. We get a few of those. We get many more saying, what can we do to prevent the next one? So I think that, that, that capacity for compassion is there and needs to be tapped into. And yes, I think that uh, Canadians will accept um, rational arguments and rational approaches. And, okay, Bumbo. Tell us a little bit about the uh, accountability structure um, after you make recommendations, um, whether or not the government's accountable to fund uh, all of the individual recommendations. Can you kind of enlighten us as to what happens after you hear? Well, the Winnipeg Sun called me a toothless watchdog. Um, <laughs> That wasn't, that wasn't the best day I've had at work. Um, the, uh, the reality is, is that as an ombudsman office, in a classical sense of an ombudsman, we have the power to make recommendations. And, and the strength of our recommendations is based on their rationality and their thoroughness. Um, and the government is not compelled to accept the recommendation, but they, but they are compelled to explain why. So they either accept or reject the recommendation, and if they accept it, then, then they, it typically goes along with an implementation plan, et cetera, et cetera. And we monitor that the best we can. And if they reject it, um, there, there's a, a gentle person's agreement that they'll at least explain why and offer something in the alternative. Uh, it's imperfect. Um, I was asked once, how come I make the same recommendations over and over and over and over again? And when I was going to stop, and I said, well, I'll stop when you listen. Um, uh, so it's very imperfect, um, but it's, it rep does represent incremental change. So we don't have enforcement power. Um, there's been discussion on and off over the years about creating a parallel office that would be uh, similar to the inspectorate office in the United Kingdom, where they have both an ombudsman and an inspectorate. So the ombudsman makes recommendations around administrative fairness and human rights issues, and the inspectorate checks for compliance. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that um, for, some, for some reasons we could discuss, but uh, that's, that's one approach. Um, there's another approach, uh, what they do in California, for example, my counterpart, uh, who's an ex-Marine um, and looks every inch the part, and he's also a former special prosecutor who was uh, handpicked by Governor Schwarzenegger to root out corruption in the state legislature. So Matt Cates, an imposing kind of guy, um, he has special peace officer and prosecutorial powers as their correctional investigator. And uh, he also has the, uh, the mandate to recommend or not rec recommend the appointment of their wardens. And so when he goes into an institution, if he sees something that doesn't like, he can arrest you and then prosecute you for it and then cost you your job. So um, he has a different approach. I'm not sure that... Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do you say? How do you think that would go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so there, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are different ways of doing it, um, but, but I, I, I think that the, 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 real, the, 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 you know, the real test here is holding the, this correctional service accountable to at least respond to the recommendation in a reasonable way, and as I say, if, they're gonna, if they've accepted it, which they often do, making sure that there's an implementation strategy that is actually, actually addresses the recommendation. And if they reject it, holding them to account for what they're going to do about the issue. Because often, it's not the issue that they don't accept. They just don't accept the prescription. 
So it's what, what are they going to do in the alternative? And uh, there is a gentleman here, Bruce Clark, who's from the Citizens Advisory Committee of the Correctional Service of Canada, uh, who just wants to say a few words before we begin the second half. I've been told to be very brief, so I'll try to do that. I'm just following up on uh, Howard's remarks that uh, crime is, he didn't use these words precisely, another presenter has, that crime is a community affair. And it's clear that crime affects an entire community, and as crime affects a community, so do those other aspects of criminology, and that has to do with uh, corrections and um, community corrections in particular. And so brings us to the Correctional Service of Canada. And Howard made a comment about the Correctional Service of Canada being defensive and a, model, a defensive monolithic organization, and that may be so, but the fact of the matter is that as a group, Correctional Service of Canada has recognized for a long time that crime is a community affair, and Howard provided some history to that. And today, that we're, we're, we're showing part of that as well, and partnering with our local uh, academic institutions. And not, not just to explain uh, an approach to community corrections today, but this is also part of uh, Correctional Service of Canada's outreach um, to explain to uh, our local community what Correctional Service of Canada is all about. And uh, Correctional Service of Canada has involved the public in day-to-day uh, -day operations since the 1970s, and since the 1990s, it's been mandated through legislation. And part of that mandate is the Citizen Advisory Committee. I'm, as um, Rob mentioned, the, a member of the local Citizen Advisory Committee for this particular area. And we have uh, uh, a Citizen Advisory Committee is, is attached to every operational unit that Correctional Service of Canada has across the country. And we have 97 committees nationwide with approximately 500 members. In British Columbia, we have 17 committees with approximately 80, 85 members. And as far as community corrections go, that's parole, we have three areas here, the Vancouver area, the New West area, and the Fraser Valley area. And uh, we also have institutional citizen advisory committees attached to the seven institutions we have in the Fraser Valley. The mandate of the citizens advisory committee is to act as the eyes and the ears and, and, and the voices for the local community. And we have three basic roles, and that role is to observe, to liaise, and to advise. And that goes both ways. We, we work with the community and we work with Correctional Canada, that's our role. And um, the way we carry that out is to, uh, on a daily basis, we, we're invited by Correctional Service Canada to observe how they deliver their programs in the community. They're very transparent about that. We're invited to participate in, in outreach programs like this where we liaise with the community and explain how the business is carried out. And we're also asked to advise. So occasionally we'll be asked to advise on policy, guidelines, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's important. We could go on all afternoon about this. It's not why we're here today. I'll just say that in closing that Correctional Services of Canada really depends on community support to fulfill its mandate. And supporting community support really includes community awareness, community involvement, and community engagement. That's what we're here today. We're hoping you're going to continue to be involved and engaged. I'd like to acknowledge, of course, as I always do, the very um, lead role that our community partners and our academic partners have played in this, particularly Simon Fraser University and Douglas College, and personally, uh, Dr. Rob Gordon, Linda Fletcher Gordon, and Lori Bogdan in organizing these committees. They've done virtually all the work, all the heavy lifting, and deserve all the credit. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. The next forum in the Ting Forum series will be March 25th. Uh, watch out for information about that forum. It will be on community corrections for Aboriginal offenders, and we will be holding that forum uh, probably at a Surrey location. So we will make the announcement when we get closer to the date, and no doubt you'll find out about it in the same way you found out about this. Uh, also, there were some handouts at the front. If anybody is missing the uh, summary of the speaker uh, and the panelists, the information about the speaker and the panelists, uh, we can make that available to you. There was also uh, a short piece summarizing uh, Mr. Saper's uh, most recent report, uh, and also an agenda uh, for today just to help you keep track of time.
Okay, one item. Thank you. You mentioned about the need to involve and engage our politicians. I should say we've uh, reached out to our politicians and we have actually a local politician in the audience here tonight. Uh, it's a councillor from the municipality of Delta, uh, Heather King. I'd like to acknowledge Councillor King's presence here tonight and thank you very much. Okay, we'll now go to the panel discussion. We have three very distinguished panels, plus a toothless watchdog who appears to have joined them. Um, obviously, obviously he's itching for more, so let him have it. Uh, at the far end, uh, my colleague from the School of Criminology at Simon Fraser University, Dr. Simon Burton Jones. Um, next to uh, Simon is uh, Dr. Art Gordon, who's the Executive Director of the Regional Treatment Centre uh, for the Correctional Service of Canada. That's uh, out Matsque Way. And then uh, Ms. Karen Sloat, who's also with the Correctional Service of Canada. Karen is the Pacific Region Coordinator, Mental Health Initiatives with CSC. So without further chatter, uh, we'll begin, I think, with uh, my namesake, Dr. Gordon. Thank you. Uh, there is a rumor that Robert is actually my evil twin. So I want you to keep that in mind in anything he says. He's already somewhat maligned me. I am no longer the executive director of the Regional Treatment Center. Uh, because I'm old and getting ready to retire, uh, I'm now on a special assignment as uh, an advisor to the Director General of Mental Health in Ottawa. I wish I could find all sorts of things to uh, attack Mr. Sapers with, because that's what Robert told me I had to do. Um, unfortunately, I agree with a lot of the things he says. Uh, there are a lot of details we could quibble with, but they're not really important. And I know that I dare not argue with him because I got this quote that I'd like you to hear. Um, Howard Sapers is one of the most intelligent, thoughtful, and articulate professionals I know. That was said by Mrs. Sapers only <laughs> three hours ago. So it's, <laughs> it's very current probably reflects the fact that Howard picked up the lunch bell, but <laughs> would like to, to touch on a number of issues that uh, in many ways uh, reinforce some of the things Howard was saying, and they're things that I hope that as a group uh, I'd be very interested in your, your comments on. Um, first of all, I, I think the impression I got as Howard was speaking You'll notice he talked about the number of offenders who had been diagnosed and the number who were getting medication and the number that, and oh, they're all different numbers and they all sort of say different things. And I think one of our challenges is how do we actually define the population that we're concerned with? And one of the main concerns I have with this, and I know that Simon uh, echoes this, is we tend to exclude the, met the, the cognitively impaired. Um, Howard made reference to fetal alcohol spectrum disordered individuals. We know that's a serious problem. It's unfortunately become almost a, um, a treat of the weak. Not that these individuals don't deserve our compassion and our attention, but there are many individuals out there who have some form of acquired brain injury. Uh, they got thumped in the head, they sniffed too much solvent, uh, they did something to acquire cognitive impairment. Um, those tend not to be as visible, and quite frankly, as a community, and I'm going to challenge us repeatedly as a community, uh, because we are the taxpayers, um, we ignore them. In many jurisdictions, you'll find when you're talking about the mentally disordered, you're talking about Axis I individuals who essentially are individuals for whom we have medications. When you get into cognitive impairment, there isn't a pill that's going to make it away, go away or be better. 
and yet we have really good evidence, uh, even locally. And Genesis, who's here from Genesis, who does a wonderful job with, with these populations, that with some care, guidance, attention, these individuals can do extremely well. So I think we have to be very careful who we're defining as our target population and never forget these individuals. Um, there's often a reference to community services and why doesn't CSC do it like the community? Then you have to ask yourself, well, what does the community do? Uh, Howard mentioned the very sad and tragic case, case of Ashley Smith. He also mentioned she had been in and out of provincial institutions repeatedly. I've checked this out with some of my provincial colleagues, say, what if an Ashley Smith showed up in your hospital? What would you do with her? Well, we'd patch her up as quickly as we can and we'd get her out as fast as we can. No one wants that sort of individual in their hospital. So the question is, what is the community standard we're really trying to, to achieve? It almost sounds as if, um, if we could uh, get up to the standard of community service in CSC, we would have the answer. And I'm not sure that for some of these populations, and I'd be very pleased to talk about the self-harmers because that's a, a, a specific research interest of mine. I'm not sure that we have all the answers. And all we can do is keep trying, keep doing the research, keep getting better at what we're doing. Uh, a couple of other things uh, that Howard raised. Uh, corrections has become the de facto mental health service provider for us, for our community. Whether it's at a provincial level, whether it's at a federal level. And as a community, we have to ask ourselves, is that what we intended? Did we intend for mental illness to be dealt with in our prisons and jails? Because that is essentially what we're doing. Um, police in almost every jurisdiction I've spoken with will tell you anywhere between 40 and 60 percent of the calls they respond to, they're responding to someone with a mental disorder. And by and large, the police are really good at this, much better in some areas than others, but they've really been tuned into these individuals and they're really looking for an option. They don't really want to arrest them. They want to take them in where they can get some help. And where do they take them? Well, as a community, we've said, uh uh, not in my hospital, because they'll sit around in the emergency room for an hour, three hours, five hours. Uh, they'll be seen and sent back into the street. Sometimes sending them to jail is the uh, kindest thing you can do because at least they're off the street and someone will hopefully pay some attention to them. As a community, what do we expect to happen to the mentally ill? Okay. Howard mentioned uh, New South Wales, and I'm very familiar with their program, wonderful program. We can also look at Nova Scotia, which has set up a uh, mental health treatment facility within one of their provincial um, prisons. You can also look at England, where I think for the most part, mental health services in prison is done by the Department of Health or whatever their, their name is, rather than the Department of Corrections. Um, in all cases, it's the, the tension between security and treatment doesn't go away. Oh, it's still there, uh, but it is a different model of doing it. Big challenge that we have as Canadians is we have 10, well, 10, 11, 12 jurisdictions who say mental health is my responsibility, and we have a correction system, which is federal, that says we have to do the same thing in every province and territory. So I, you know, I find that model very attractive. I'm not sure how we would apply it to our federal, provincial um, jurisdictions. Um, stigmatization, I think you touched on this briefly. 
To me, that's a really central problem for us. And I think the Mental Health Commission has equally recognized that that's one of the basic thrusts of what they hope to accomplish over the next few years. Basically, how many of you in this audience have dealt with someone who is mentally ill? I mean, face to face. Wow, no wonder you all came out today. <laughs> Do they scare you? No. no. You ask any 10 people on the street who, by and large, if they see someone who looks like there's a potential that possibly they are a little crazy, immediately cross the street, right, avert their eyes, and walk on. And that's not because the person's doing anything threatening, but they look different. They act different. If our community is so rife with these beliefs and misperceptions and stigmatization against the mentally ill, and I use the broad brush, cognitively impaired, why should our institutions be any different? I've had people from hospitals um, say the same thing to me, referring to the doctors and the nurses. If it's that widespread, why would we think that those of us who work in corrections because after all, we weren't born in corrections. We did come from the community. Why wouldn't we have those same fears, misapprehensions? And how do we deal with that? I think CSE has really stepped up to the plate in terms of training. How many of you know of research that says you can train attitudes? Right? You don't train people in an attitude, not in a three-hour session, not in a two-day session. You can provide them with some information, but when you're changing basic attitudes, you're looking at a much more difficult task, and an achievable one, because as a smoker, I can vouch for this. How have our attitudes towards smoking changed in 10 years? Day and night, okay? So we know as a community, how we can change attitudes. All of us start yelling at me at once, get out of here, smoke somewhere else. We know we can do it, but that's where each of us comes in and each of us has to be part of the voice that starts speaking up and breaking down that stigmatization. Okay? And I'll stop there, give my colleagues a chance and hopefully we'll come back to some of these. Thank you, Rob. Thank Karen? you, Mom. <laughs> Karen, would you like to go next? Oh, I'd love to. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stick a little more to what Corrections is doing in, in response to... Oh, am I not speaking loudly enough into the microphone? I usually have such a loud, booming voice. Um, I'll speak a little more to uh, some, of the, some of the issues that uh, Howard suggested that CSC pursue. Um, we are actually pursuing, um, actually I would say virtually all of these items on a variety of levels and I think that Art has very eloquently outlined some of the larger kind of societal challenges that we have as an organization. Um, you know, while we remove people from community via the sentence they receive, certainly prisons and penitentiaries are, penitentiaries are a part of our larger community and certainly influenced by that. Um, Needless to say, the issue is complex and quite challenging for us. We are traditionally a correctional organization, and we have had a very significant and rapid population change in the last decade that's really required some very rapid response from us. We're a big organization, we're a national organization, and it, it's a big thing to move forward. Um, we are seeking permanent funding for the Community Mental Health Initiative, just to let you know, um, and I'm, I'm quite optimistic despite what's, what's going on lately. I'm, maybe that's my job. <laughs> um, but we've seen some definite uh, positive results from the Community Mental Health Initiative, and while Howard has said that um, only 50 new positions in the country have been created, well, that's true. We've also had a lot of opportunities to actually work with community partners in contracting. So that goes above and beyond the staff that we've hired. Um, 
which has had just a tremendous impact and positive influence in working with offenders to living with mental illness in a, in a variety of our communities across the country. Um, we've seen definite improvements in suspension and revocation rates with this population and I think that anecdotally at the very least at this point we've also definitely made some great inroads with partnering with the health authorities with community living um, with some particularly challenging and complex individuals where we've seen great success um, it's been very well received organizationally it just it was not a challenge to implement that in terms of attitude or otherwise I think it was very well recognized that it was a necessary initiative um, so it's been quite a pleasure working on that front. We are also proceeding with funding for the intermediate mental health care units that Howard was um, mentioning. And these, th the purpose of these units, they'll actually be properly resourced with mental health staff. Um, they're not kind of pseudo-segregation units we're speaking about. Um, we're looking at hiring more and more mental health care professionals along, you know, to really provide that multidisciplinary complement um, to our organization. Recruitment and retention, we've also developed a national strategy, and I actually think we've done a, a, a great job at recruiting externally, and I always look forward to these kinds of forms because I look out and I see all these students that will be looking for jobs someday soon. So go to our website, um, just a little plug. Um, but it is an exciting time in the organization. It's an exciting time for change. Um, there, there's a lot of interesting things happening on a number of fronts. Um, and and we've, we've managed to draw in some really, really great expertise from, from outside of the organization as well as tapping into our own existing resources. Accountability framework, yes, I would agree. We definitely need to, to continue work there. Um, this region in particular, as Howard plugged us so, so positively, I will agree, we are a fabulous region. Um, but we are working actually regionally on a, a fully integrated mental health framework. We're actually holding our own internal workshop next week to again further reach out to non-health care partners within the region to really kind of work out the details of how do we create that multidisciplinary, you know, um, continuum of care approach. The self-harm population, there are a number of issues, uh, a number of initiatives underway nationally and within the regions in order to address this, this uh, very significant need for us. Um, it's a very complex population and there's very little research too from an institutional perspective on this population. The behaviors manifested in institutions look very different from the behaviors by, you know, people who engage in acts of self-harm in the community. It's not, you can't just replicate service, so it's, I, and I, quite frankly, I'm not sure how much service is taking place in, the, in, in mainstream community. Um, in terms of mental health training, we have been busy. Um, very, very busy. We have rolled out over the last two or three years significant amounts of training to both community correction staff, um, community <coughs> partners, institutional staff, correctional <coughs> officers, nurses. Um, we are training more and more correctional officers this year. Uh, approximately 300 psychologists underwent uh, a rather rigorous suicide assessment training in the last year and it just keeps growing. We have implemented fetal alcohol spectrum disorder training and it's, uh, effective interventions training. It just seems like that in and of itself has been, become a full-time job. Um, I, I could go on and on about all that is being done. I think that Howard's outlined the challenges that we continue to have quite well, but I am optimistic that we are on the right, the right path um, we didn't, we don't invite people to come into penitentiary and spend some time. You know, we don't, we don't create our population. Our population is created for us, um, and sometimes very quickly. Um, so I, I, these are, these are our realities. Um, these are also some of the, the initiatives that were, were uh, underway with organizationally. So I, I do invite you actually to go check out the Correctional Service website. There is actually a fair amount of information about what we are doing and of course or employment opportunities. Um, and on that note, my shameless plug, I will hand the mic over again.
Thank you, Karen. Um, Simon, your response. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be involved in this forum and to be with such distinguished colleagues, many of whom I know quite well. I'd like to put in a plug for Howard first. I met Howard uh, 30 years ago, I think. And uh, he's not really changed. He's still that very gentle, kind person who also is very firm, something I discovered very early in my association with him. And I'd just like to put a plug for someone who's taking a very brave stand for mental health. It's been an important part of a number of reports he's made. And it takes courage to say these things in Canada. Uh, look what happened to chair of the RCMP Complaints Commission and his predecessor, um, who actually raised the issue. She was so frustrated with the lack of action by the RCMP in dealing with what she saw as a cultural problem in the force with dealing with the mentally ill that she resigned. So I think it's very brave of you hired to take this stand, and I applaud you for it. Of course, I can say these things because I'm not part of CSC. <laughs> um, the other thing I'd just like to mention is how um, Howard and I were taking part in a very significant forum on mental health and corrections in Ottawa in June, where all the vice presidents and presidents of the commissioners, and, and including the minister, were present. And, as an aside, I'd like to say I was very impressed with the fact that the previous minister did seem to make mental illness a major priority. He was really very interested in it, and I'm very sorry he's moved on. But during this two-day meeting, I heard basically spill the beans and uh, suggested that I taught him everything he know, the kind of thing you say when your ex-professor is there, but you don't really mean it. <laughs> but all the other people in the room in CSC took it very seriously, and they all started to look at me very peculiarly. <laughs> and I was very worried for my safety, and I actually had to exit <laughs> from the back of the building in case I was arrested as a threat to national security. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I don't disagree with anything Howard said, and, um, and neither of Karen and I, actually Art and I have a bee in our bonnets about approaching this issue of neurocognitive impairment and underdiagnosis. So what I'd like to do is really be provocative because it might try and get some response from the audience. And the first thing I'd say is that the way we're looking at this is totally upside down. We're talking about how corrections is going to provide services to the mentally disordered. And I think really it should be the other way around. It's how should we prevent people from getting to the situation where they get involved with the justice system in the first place? And of course, you can take a very broad stroke on your canvas when you're painting it, and you can say, yes, we go right back to the very beginning. What is it that tends to produce situations where people get involved with justice? Well, number one is socially disorganized environments, poverty, stress. And we know there's an interaction between genetics and environment, which tends to produce personality disorders, conduct disorders, and involvement with the authorities. We know that child abuse is probably the most significant factor in developing problematic behavior among a significant proportion of the population. We should be talking about these kinds of things. I guess we do talk about it, we just don't do anything about it. Uh, prevention, everyone goes on at every conference you go to, but you actually need a strategy. I agree entirely with what I said about neurocognitive impairment, and one of the points I'd make is we really have to be specific what we're talking about in terms of mental disorder. As Howard rightly points out, there's no relationship between mental disorder and criminal behavior. There are many other intermediary factors which bring the mentally disordered into contact with the justice system. But what we often overlook is that the mentally disordered actually have multiple problems. It's not just one problem. So you very often find someone with serious mental illness who also has neurocognitive impairment. It could be ADHD, it could be fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, very likely some type of brain injury. Uh, and incidentally, I tried to do a study to see the extent of um, uh, brain injury in BC provincial corrections. And while we had funding from the Ministry of Health, the bureaucracy set up around BC corrections to prevent you doing research meant that we didn't do it. And yet, uh, we did a little study in the forensic uh, hospital and found that probably a half of the population there had uh, a brain injury to the point of unconsciousness, but it was completely undiagnosed. It was not in their record. 
and brain injuries can interact with other things like substance abuse to produce behaviors which may lead to impulsive decision making and that's what tends to bring people into contact with the justice system. So in terms of strategy, we should be focusing more attention on how we deal with neurocognitive impairment because that's what causes people to make bad decisions. And that's what keeps bringing them back into the justice system in a revolving door. So in provincial corrections, you have large numbers of people having very short sentences who are cycling through the system, through the mental health system that just goes on and on. Because we're not really focusing society's energies on trying to address and diagnose these disorders, but then they're the personality disorders, which we know are associated with bad decision making. We need to invest a lot of money into trying to find treatments that work. Otherwise, you're always going to have prisons, and you're always going to have correction systems, and you're always going to have a large number of people cycling through these systems. We need to address the environment, social disorganization. Uh, Virginia Hyde, who's probably the leading uh, sociologist in mental health in the United States, said it's absolutely crazy to be putting people through various systems and then you return them to the very same environment which produced a lot of the dysfunctional behavior. So we need to start looking at the whole area of spatial analysis, where we place people. This gets you into political problems. Not in my backyard syndrome and all the rest of it. But we know if you place facilities in stable neighborhoods, you have a much greater likelihood that that individual will not relapse. And one of my graduate students did a very interesting study which we just published using spatial analysis to show that where you place people who are released from the forensic mental health system has a great deal of impact on whether those people will relapse and be brought back into the system. Now, housing seems to be probably one of the most important things you can do to reduce people cycling through the mental health and correction system. And there is very good news. The provincial government, the federal government, and municipal governments in Vancouver and other municipalities have recognized that housing with supportive services is absolutely critical. So money is going to that. That's very good news. Part of it comes from the fact that a study was done by CARMA, which is a research organization associated with SFU, which found that governments can save $20,000 per year by giving supportive housing to individuals who are on the edge of homelessness or are homeless. Why is there such a saving in money? Because when these individuals keep going through emergency service, getting involved with the police, the courts, emergency rooms, it's extremely expensive. And particularly expensive where you've got substance abuse disorders with mental disorders. That's actually, if you track that through the system, that's what's costing the province by far the most, because we can now track costs across various ministries. And uh, housing is a very important part in reducing those costs. And having these people with supportive services not going through emergency services. We need to move to a model of what uh, there's a an editorial in the American Journal of Psychiatry by Richard Lamb uh, very recently, and he said we need to have assertive delivery of mental health services. We need multi-agency teams going out into the community and actually addressing problems they find. Why do we have the police doing this? Right now, we use, we're one of the few countries where police are pr the primary first responders. That's very expensive, and they don't necessarily have the expertise to do this. We need to think beyond the envelope and start moving money and putting money into preventive services with individuals who are not connected directly with the justice system. A few years ago, I was at a very interesting conference of stakeholders in this area, and um, Mr. Justice Vickers, who's just resigned as a Supreme, or he's retired from the Supreme Court of BC, uh, previously Deputy Attorney General of British Columbia, got up and said in one of these meetings, look, take the budget of BC Corrections and just put it into mental health because it's exactly the same population. And most of the people agree. And yet, BC Corrections sets up a special mental health program to provide mental health services. So what we need to be focusing on is linking people to services before they reach the justice system. Well. One of our problems with our mental health system is it's geared towards dealing only with emergencies. You can't just go to your general practitioner and say, 
you want treatment for schizophrenia or bipolar or schizoaffective disorder. A study done by CMHA found that if you had schizophrenia and you had the initial symptoms, it would take you three years before you accessed services. When you had acute symptoms, it might take you from eight months to a year. If you had a mood disorder, it may take you six or seven years to access services. And five months from the time you had acute disorders. So what happens in this study, it's a little bit out of date. It was done 10 years ago. Unfortunately, no study has been funded to bring it up to date, so the figures may not be quite right. But they found that 60% of people were accessing mental health service for the first time through emergency rooms. And half of that group were brought by the police. That is outrageous. <laughs> How can you run a health system where you're dealing with a situation where people can only come into an emergency setting and half of them being brought by the police? Another thing, we don't have a good triage center in the lower mainland. That's to say a place where police can take people that's outside the justice system. And then, in, and Calgary has perhaps uh, one of the models for this um, type of program, where individuals can be brought if they have mental disorder, but also people who have substance abuse, because very often you get labeled. And uh, if you have substance abuse, a whole lot of programs are not open to you. But the Calgary model will take people in a facility. If there's a criminal justice issue, the police and prosecutors can decide whether or not they want to go the justice option. Very often, they decide not to, and the person is put directly into the health system. Equally, the courts don't have any easy way of accessing mental health services. We have a really problematic constitution in Canada, I refer, refer to it, with each province and territory having its own health system, and then we have the federal uh, parliament making the criminal law and criminal justice procedure and so on. But very briefly, a judge in England and Wales with someone who's seriously mentally disordered can immediately have them transferred to a hospital on a hospital order. There are restrictions on that person leaving the hospital. I won't go into that. But the point is that once that individual is sent to the hospital, it's a one-way street. They don't go back into corrections. So it's a very good way of making sure that someone who's seriously mentally ill is moved quickly out of the court and correction system into hospital. Canada does not have anything like this. As far as, am I going on too long? You're looking at me in a brooding way, so. Well. <laughs> and I'm used to being Dan Trodden, he's my boss. So. No, please. Okay, very quickly, very quickly, we did want to talk specifically about uh, community corrections. And I think it's very important to bear in mind, I would refer to this, that the mentally, oh, actually hard, sorry, refer to this, that the mentally disordered spend, spend, tend to spend more time in custody. But uh, studies done by Dr. Arbelie de Flores and Heather Stewart show that in Canada that the mentally disordered actually spend a lot more time in pretrial custody. And when you add their total time, it's much more than matched individuals with similar offenses who are not seriously mentally disordered. So, community corrections. I, I, I suppose one thing I should mention is that we have a really excellent forensic mental health system in British Columbia. Well, we're putting in plugs for British Columbia Howard, but we actually have one of the best I've seen in the world. Individuals who are found not criminally responsible, unfit to stand trial, they get really good care, and it's a continuum of care. The problem is, and it's the one that comes up with community erections, is when they are released from that, and actually by law, if you're no longer a threat in the forensic system, you have to be released. The Supreme Court of Canada said that. And when people leave the care of the Correctional Service of Canada, whatever it is, BC Corrections, what happens to them? Well, they very often fall off the edge. And the problem is that they're not, as Art pointed out, clients that are often very acceptable. They may have personality disorders. They may have problems of dealing with authority because of the way they've been coerced into treatment in the past. And they may not be individuals who are accepted. They get banned from daycare facilities and so on. So one of the things that seems to be important is actually having some individual who has authority to move people seamlessly from one system to another. Hank Stedman, who's a medical sociologist in the United States focused on mental health, invented the idea of the boundary spanner. 
the idea of someone who had authority across different jurisdictions. And this means that when the person leaves community corrections, there is actually someone who's linking them up to the, quote, regular system of mental health, health and social services. And incidentally, the mentally disordered tend to get poor health services in general. I may talk about that if, if we get into discussion. This is a real issue for me, is the fact that mentally disordered do not get always a high quality health care for various reasons, stigma being one of them. Another issue we should focus on is that the more I talk in focus groups with professionals is that they seem to admit there is a silo mentality that people seem to think that people go into certain programs and they don't communicate with each other. And there is a problem that very often it's a diagnosis which leads to your treatment. And they focus on a primary diagnosis. Very often the substance abuse is the one that will determine where you may go in terms of programs. And yet, if we thought about it more rationally, we'd be looking at things on a much more holistic basis seeing that individuals have multiple social problems, none of which are totally identical, and then developing individual treatment plans. And this is very much the kind of thing that Howard was talking about and looks like CSC is implementing, which is individual treatment plans. And I think that's something that should be minimum standard across Canada, that when someone's being released, there is a very coherent plan as to how that person is going to get treatment over time. And individuals who have multiple problems, they don't get better when their sentence finishes. They may need ongoing support, assistance, up to their level of competence for many years into the future. Okay, last comments really. Uh, we all know that one of the major problems is that we treat substance abuse as a criminal problem. And if we treat it as a criminal problem, people are going to land up in the criminal justice system. It makes sense. But we t that's what we've chosen to do as a society. We treat individuals with substance abuse problems through the criminal justice system. Now that creates a lot of problems because what happens is they become alienated from health services. And a student in um, health sciences in, in Simon Fraser recently defended a thesis. Very interesting. She looked at the drug court in Vancouver over its first few years. Things have changed a little bit because now Coastal Health has taken over services for that court and things may be a little bit different. But what she found is that after going through the drug treatment process, the drug court process, actually most people didn't make it through to the end, but once you went through the process, they were no more likely to be linked with health services than before. Why? Because they were alienated. Why? Because they don't like being coerced. Courts are about coercion. And similarly, you know, civil commitment shouldn't be the way we provide service. And that gets to my last point, and that is um, very wise people have said to me, look, really what you need is not only money, but you need a bit of patience. You actually have to sit down and talk to people. So that a lot of the issues we see where people with mental health issues who have real problems, who come into contact with the police, as an RCMP officer told me, very often what happens is the police create their own bubble. They don't sit down and talk to the person and say, what's your problem? They want to take control and deal with it as efficiently as possible. And yet if they actually sat down and talked to that individual, the outcome may be very different. And that's important because we, what we know from research is that if people feel coerced, then they actually carry a resentment to anyone further in the process. So every time you traumatize someone in an interaction, that has an effect for everyone else in the system. So it's in everyone's interest to actually, at the front end of the system, sit down, take some time, and try and speak to individuals as individual human beings, not as problems who have to be dealt with in a finite period of time. And I suppose I could say uh, many other things, uh, but Yes, I, 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 I can read signals. Thank you, Simon. Um, okay, what I'm going to do is uh, open it up for questions from the floor, and then, because I know he's busting to, to respond, and then we'll come back to Howard when we get towards the end of that, uh, to give him an opportunity to, uh, to respond to some of the uh, panelists. So, Let's go with uh, questions or comments. Um, open up the dialogue. Yes, sir. Just uh, have a comment. Uh, earlier, uh, Dr. Gordon mentioned Genesis House and the 
what they do for the community. And just in response, Dr. Bernard Jones, when you were talking about the seamlessness of transition of offenders into the community, Genesis House is a representative in this community of our community residential facility. We could not do what we were able to do. We, we don't take all that credit. If we didn't have a good relationship with uh, Correction Service Canada, and it's because of that innovative, um, organic, almost open-mindedness that there are programs that they introduce into this community. And for you, Dr. Sorry, I'm trying to keep up here, Mr. Sapers, uh, sometimes we don't get to see the whole national perspective, but for this community, we can speak uh, as far as Corrections Canada. Uh, we, as house managers, are witness to the opportunities afforded to offenders, especially of mentally disordered. And some of the programs are allowing uh, a representative of, uh, of Ministry of Employment and Income Assistance to go into the institution to address the issue of homelessness. Because corrections understands that that's part of the recidivism that takes place for offenders getting out. So they try to meet those areas before they come up, and that creates a seamless opportunity. So sometimes we don't get to see the local picture, we just see the global picture, and can can sometimes not. Uh, allow us to see the full vision that Corrections has. And so we're privy to a lot of the innovative ideas and they're working. And uh, leaders are credit for that. Do you want to respond? How does one respond to getting credit for something? Uh, I, I think in fairness, uh, we worked, I know with the Regional Treatment Centre, we worked for years with Genesis House, and Genesis House is a point of light that we value, right? The reality is that when we release individuals to the community, they are not only stigmatized because they are mentally disordered in one way or another, but now they carry the offender label. Almost no offender that I can recall that we've had in corrections was there for the first time, like they discovered their mental illness when they were incarcerated. These are individuals who are known to everyone in the professional community. They have received service from virtually everyone in the community, and yet somehow they end up at some point in federal corrections. You try and send them back to the community, and like no one wants to touch them. I mean, it's, it's a degree of stigmatization that doesn't even make any sense. They know this individual, they know his history, they don't want to deal with him. And it, it, it's not like, I don't want to paint the community with that broad brush. There are many excellent people who work very closely with us, who, who are really getting engaged, but it's not universal. Right? And in fact, there are parts of our very own mental health legislation that prohibits the sharing of services for federal offenders and provincial services. Right? Big issue, as you pointed out, and, and Howard did, I think, what if we get them through their, um, their mandatory supervision period? Uh, correction service can only has legal authority up to a certain point. If you've been sentenced to five years, five years is over, you're gone, right? Um, what happens to the individual then? So we try and work really hard to build that into the release planning. As, as Simon says, it's not what are your plans for the next week, what is it going to be for the next five to ten years? Uh, but sometimes the individual, the community, isn't really prepared to deal with the individual, even when they reach that point where CSC's no longer involved. And the sad thing is, in fairness to the community, they are not over-resourced. <laughs> I mean, the resources for mental illness in our community is really sparse. So I, I can't... I don't want to paint them with a malevolent brush. Uh, they are struggling with limited resources, just as we are, uh, as all of us. But somehow, we are dealing with individuals. How do you drop an individual off the table when you know they're going to fall and hurt themselves and potentially get back into trouble? Uh, th this is, ultimately, it's not only in the interest of the offender. Uh, it's in the interest of the community to have that person succeed. And as several people have mentioned, whatever services you get in the community, it's 100 times cheaper 
then housing them at the regional treatment center or at mountain institution or in provincial jails. We are the Cadillac of costs, not of service, but for the community, if you want to save money, keep them out of jail and prison. You'll do really, really well. Thank you, Al. Yes, ma'am. Um, I work with a small group of individuals based out of Pitt Meadows. Um, Pitt Meadows is a provincial local school area. Uh, school District 42 is operating a program called Connects, which takes individuals who've been removed from the school system and um, placed basically in the care of their parents because they are involved in the criminal justice system. And um, these kids are going to be the criminals of the next. 20 and 30 years because they are mentally disordered. Currently, they are being given care, you know, like Connects offers these kids a place to go. They have several different options when they're in Connects to connect with their role officer, a mental health care worker, um, an academic supervisor who provides with them the, the schooling that they need. But what is there for these kids once they get out? And furthermore, the problems that they face isn't just their mental illness or the fact that they're involved in the correctional system. They also have no housing. A lot of times they don't have parents. They're being subsidized to live and go to school on a, on a budget of $600 a month. Well, I can't live on $600 a month. How can they? So what are we doing to address issues for these long-term problems? <coughs> it's not an issue of five or 10 years. It's an issue more of a lifetime. These kids are not going to be rehabilitated. They have schizophrenia, uh, persistent chronic mood disorders. These are not problems that we currently have solutions for. These aren't treatable things in the sense that they're going to go away. How are we going to address, you know, in, in 15 years when little Jimmy is out of connects and doesn't have private funding anymore and isn't working because he has a criminal record but he still has schizophrenia, and schizophrenia isn't going away. So they do end up in our, in our correctional institution, and we're back to where we started, if not worse, because it's just getting propagated while he's in the criminal justice system. What do we do about that? Anybody with the answer? <laughs> Pamela? Does it work for Ashley? You know, I, I, I think what you're you're really talking about is really how disjointed all of these different systems are, right? I mean, I mean, the school system isn't connected to the healthcare system, which isn't connected to the criminal justice system, which is disconnected in and of itself, a, a, a little, well, probably maybe to a lesser degree, but certainly still disconnected between, you know, provincial and federal and youth custody. And there's, there's so many layers of bureaucracy and so many different streams of funding, which, encourages and supports different mandates and you know I've, I've had the opportunity to actually listen to to some some speakers from around the, the world in, in in recent times given what I'm doing right now and and a few of them spoke about the courage of politicians to move the agenda forward and I think that you know I would imagine the vast majority of this room is of age to vote and, and, and we have influence, and I think we need to be exercising that as, as community members. What are we willing to accept? What do we expect for our future? And that includes these individuals that we're all caring for, you know, and, and, and really trying to work toward the elimination of some of that, those silos in, in bureaucracies that have kind of been created Without any master plan, I'm quite convinced, because I just, I mean, this is, no one organized this. It's <laughs> yeah, 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 there's good news and there's bad news. Yeah, this is our plan. How do you like it so far? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess there's, there's two things, and I, I, I don't want to sound um, too, too simple or naive when I say this, but, you know, the issues that, that you raise are, are persistent. Um, the, the, the answer is always the same answer, you know, well, we, we, we need to take a control locally of, of integrating our response, that, uh, you know, resources and commitment and will and awareness aren't really the problems. Um, the, the problem is, is that we're not doing a very good job of fitting all the pieces together. And I, I've been engaged in those kinds of discussions th throughout my career. Um, and, and so is, is obviously there's something more to it than that. Um, 
and, and there's something more to it I, I think Karen's very close to in terms of matching that knowledge with political commitment and political will. But, but, I'll, but, I'll, but I'll take her suggestion, if I may, Karen, one step further. And, and, and that is, um, I, I, have some, I have some political experience. And um, I can tell you that politicians love getting out in front of a parade that's already in progress and, uh, and, and, and then saying, follow me. So um, it's very important to be engaged in this discussion. And that's why I mean, I, that's why I, this is where I'm trying not to be simplistic and naive, but it's very important to stay focused on what it is you want to accomplish. Um, and uh, the Canadian Mental Health Commission is, is aware of this and their stigma campaign, which is a huge part of how they're spending their first allocation of millions of dollars in terms of creating awareness and, 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 and breaking down some of those uh, barriers that have been constructed because of the stigma of mental illness. Um, are very key components so that uh, one day we may actually be not talking about being afraid of somebody with obvious uh, signs of mental illness just like we wouldn't cross the street because we saw somebody walking with crutches you know maybe one day we won't cross the street because we see somebody talking to themselves of course these days with those Bluetooth things you, you, you can't tell anyway <laughs> but um, so, uh, I, so I guess what I'm saying is be very aware that there is a political dynamic and a political element, but it starts, it does, it, it's the same answer. It starts with that sort of local awareness, and that, local, um, um, that local awareness, and uh, people that are involved in the political process will recognize that, and um, once it becomes loud enough and powerful enough, uh, they'll want to be part of it. Thank you, Howard. Yes, sir. I'm just wondering, uh, I think that parade is already going on. I think there is a lot of uh, schizophrenia in our community that has been doing well. Okay, if they're not, I think we know a lot about it. Mm -hmm. So, would the politician look at those people, not just schizophrenia, but other social problems that are doing well and follow what has been doing well? Why are they doing well? Why? The parade is out there. <laughs> I can see Karen saying you're spending a lot of funding in the initiative and so on correction. Now, where is the effectiveness of this funding? Does it feel down to the actual concern, the inmate? You have a lot of trained staff. Okay? I got through that myself. I see how the programs thing going on the last 20 years within correction is not working really well. There's a lot of training staff. But when it filled it down to the inmates part, the effectiveness really, really diminished. So I, I'd like you to look at that too. And you know, the parades out there, there's positive going on out there. Why are we not looking at that? Why not we taking that, their footsteps? You know, the family's taking care of them, their profession, the passion about it, their medication, that works. Okay, I'm not a, a pharmaceutical student, so I'm okay to say that. <laughs> I have no, I have no illnesses of any kind, so I cannot say that uh, uh, those are uh, 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 panacea. I don't know. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that. I'm just saying there are things that you work in the community. Why are we not looking at? Them? Yeah. If I can respond to a bit of that, because I think we do know what works. Uh, one of the things we've gotten very good at is developing risk predictions. And we know what factors are associated with criminal behavior, and what factors are associated with not engaging in criminal behavior. And the sort of things that are not associated with criminal behavior are medications. Right? Several people have said, uh, not only is mental illness not a predictor of crime, in some models it's a protective factor. If you are schizophrenic, according to the VRAG, for those of you who are studying for finals, um, that is actually a protective factor. You get fewer risk points. And there, uh, Jennifer Skeen uh, from California has just come up with some really nice research sort of reaffirming all of this and, and uh, illustrating what Simon said, that uh, we have to think beyond services for the mentally disordered as being seeing a psychiatrist and getting medication. That may be necessary. It's far from sufficient. What is necessary is stable housing. What is necessary are stable pro-social associates. 
What is necessary is what is sometimes called stable employment, but convert that to stable structured activities, right? Um, what is a predictor is stable pro-social leisure activities, right? And we know these are predictive of crime in the entire population. They are equally predictive for the population we're talking about. And they are services that don't require a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a nurse. They require the community. Right? And you're right, very often living with a family is the best thing that can happen to you because you have two or three of those factors taken into account together. A lot of our fellows don't really have much of a family or a family that really wants to deal with them. And that's where a group like Genesis can provide the, the uh, stability, the social contacts, the, the structure. But it's those sorts of things that, um, the the um, well the NGO it's not even NGO uh, often it's the faith communities that really step to the forefront in terms of providing this sort of support and I've been suggesting have any of you ever heard of circles of support and accountability uh, everyone for those of you who haven't this is a program came out of the Central Mennonite Committee. Uh, in, in Ontario, it spread, spreading uh, like, like a virus, but slowly. Um, that wraps itself around uh, very high risk sex offenders after they are beyond their warrant expiry. So they are no longer under control of the criminal justice system, but they're very high risk. And it's a group of community members who come together, they're trained, they're supported, and they provide the structured support, they provide the associates, they, prov they help with finding the employment, the leisure time, just checking in on. We need something like that for a lot of our mentally disordered offenders. Because a lot of them, it's not so much they go out to be bad, it's just they sort of forget about where they're at and they're so easily led, they can very easily find themselves where they shouldn't be. So those are the sort of things we know work. Can we as a community start providing some of those relatively low cost, easy to provide, you don't need a PhD to do it, sort of services, and the outcomes will probably improve as we do that. Um, we actually have uh, one of the uh, women twirlers who is a very uh, high-risk, chronic uh, self-injury uh, with a lot of violence and arson as well, and the circle of support has um, taken her Excellent. under their uh, Excellent. under their wing, and um, she's been out now since the end of November without reoffending, um, and that's the longest time got to comment on this one because it bridges into comments how we said earlier about self-harm. Uh, one of the things that our the very uh, first glimpses of data are telling us, we have individuals in corrections who cannot go pretty much a day without self-harming themselves, sometimes two, three, four times a day. Can you imagine what it's like to work with someone like this? And yet, we now have an accumulating small number of cases where as they leave the institution, they stop self-harming. Maybe it's, it's having that social support, but not all of them have the social support. I'm not sure why it is yet, but it's, it's a, a remarkable, because it's, I've not yet heard of someone who was into self-harming inside who continued it in the community, it's very rare. Um, something we need to, to figure out because what you're doing in the community is probably something we have to figure out how do we bring that inside. Okay, thank you. Did you have to question? I don't think you can. I did, I was thinking about the whole social justice issue and how we produce criminals and um, <clears throat> about how people are marginalized and then they go into jail and most of the people in jail are not wealthy. They're the ones who couldn't afford a good lawyer. And if they don't have community 
for it before they go in. For all, you know, and, and a lot of the people I see are, are like the young woman who was talking about from um, Maple Ridge connects. Connects. Connects in Maple Ridge. convictions for fraud and theft. I have been in the federal penitentiary six times. Five of those times I have had court-ordered psychological counseling. Out of those five times I have had court-ordered psychological counseling, I have never got it once. The attitude of Corrections Canada when you arrive inside the doors are, I don't care what the judge said to you, he sentenced you to three years, that's how long we have you for. We will assess you from there. I have begged for help. Mr. Sapers, you and I have had conversations in the past. I have begged for help. I have written the Minister of Justice and the Minister of Corrections for help. Have never gotten it. When I am released on parole or on warrant on, on my two-thirds, on my statutory release, I still do not get psychological counseling in the community. During my last sentence, I had to pay an outside counselor $80 an hour from my institutional pay to get help, to find out that I was molested as a child and that I have personality issues that Corrections Canada failed me on for 23 years. This is the first time since I was 22 years old that I have not reoffended. I have not reoffended, not by the help of Christ. Nothing for me. Nothing, even though they were under judge's orders. Even after being released into community corrections, you did nothing for me. Okay, let's um, let's hear from. The panel, you got any comments? My, my question actually was, is you're, you're starting to do this in the community, but what are you doing inside corrections <coughs> to help offenders who want the help? Even if I'm a non-scheduled offender, which means I'm not violent, even though I'm a non-scheduled offender, because everybody's busy doing risk assessments for lifers and violent offenders, now what are you going to do to help offenders like myself to ease that transition into the community to get me help inside instead of tossing me onto the street again with no help. Karen's responsible, so I'm going to lie. She did it. I said no, no, but she said yeah. I, 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 I apologize. I, I don't know you, and I would not speak specifically to your experience regardless of that, um, just because of privacy issues, quite frankly. Um, but I, I can actually speak to what is taking place institutionally. Um, we do now have permanent funding for um, intake screening for mental health issues. 
um, to date um, since it's been implemented. 3,400 offenders nationally have actually undergone this screening. Um, the screening basically targets psychological distress at intake. Um, and then from there, we look at kind of further assessments around mental health issues. Um, in this region, again, Pacific region, um, we are actually also undertaking cognitive screening. Um, and actually, ART was quite integral in, in the implementation of, of a pilot a few years ago where we um, began screening actually in this region um, using additional scales, um, including the Cognostat and a structured clinical interview. Um, we do quite a comprehensive mental health intake screening. We also have primary mental health services now within the institutions. Um, so in you know, addition to our traditional psychology complement, which traditionally has been very focused on risk assessments um, and only able to target crisis issues. Um, we now have additional psychology support, mental health nursing, social work, um, some occupational therapy, um, and they are working with offenders with mental health ins issues in regular institutions. Um, that is a rather broad definition for us federally. Um, we're not just looking at Axis One disorders. We do take into consideration uh, personality disorders with moderate to significant functioning impairment, developmental disability, and of course, brain injury acquired or organic, um, including fetal alcohol. So it's, it's a broad definition. It is a big agenda. We're only starting. I think we can definitely use more. Um, Ideally, people should not come to prison to access mental health services, but they're here, and we have to address it, and we are. Um, it is new. Permanent funding only started in 2008. Um, initial funding began in 2007. We are just about fully implemented. Uh, the majority of staff are now in place and working in institutions. So. Um, this is actually happening nationally as well um, across the country. These types of services have been implemented. So that's. I, I, I am glad that there is a start of things going on because I'm not the only person. I mean, I know of many offenders that had asked for help, and the only thing we were told we were going to get help is if we felt we were going to harm ourselves or somebody else. Yeah. And as an offender, that's the last thing you want on your file is that he's going to harm himself or harm others because it ends your chances of possibly parole, minimum security. The backlash for making that comment is horrendous. You know, speaking, speaking as someone who actually worked in operations for 10 years before kind of coming into my role now and, and prior to that working in a not-for-profit with offenders under community supervision, um, I don't want to see that on anyone's file. I quite frankly, you know, I, I took this in order to promote the elimination of that type of behavior. It is dangerous and tragic quite frankly. Okay, Simon? I'd just like to make a comment, and that is um, I've been involved with an initiative of the International Center for Criminal Law Reform, and what we're trying to do is to develop the idea that there should be minimum standards for the delivery of mental health services across Canada, not just the federal system, but provincial system. Unfortunately, um, the person who uh, developed a very good framework uh, uh, and report on this, Jamie Livingston, left a little while ago. But uh, we, I have been trying to introduce this program for 10 years. Um, suddenly, the window of opportunity opened and people started to listen. So we did actually develop this uh, document and gave it to the Correctional Service of Canada, who actually paid for it. They didn't ask for it, but they paid for it. <laughs> and um, it actually seems to have had some impact because it was used by federal and, uh, sorry, provincial and territorial uh, corrections in a self-assessment exercise. And Jamie was actually invited to testify before the Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security in Ottawa together with the Mental Health Commission. And um, how I've mentioned the Mental Health Commission, they're actually very important, because I think they have actually focused some of the politicians' uh, views on mental health, and particularly its relationship to criminal justice. So the idea would be if we actually have minimum standards, then the kind of issue that you raise could actually be looked at rather more objectively. There would be audits, 
and it would lead to more consistency because one of the things you would find across Canada as in any federal system is a tremendous disparity in the levels of service that are available. The, uh, the federal system actually has some standards in legislation. It actually does specify that uh, people in the system are entitled to certain types of health care, including mental health care. The problem is there are no concrete standards where you translate these very general principles into concrete standards. I mean, it may be as concrete as saying what types of service should be available, what types of people should be available in institutions of certain size. So I see that as being a very, um, a very beneficial development in that maybe this is a way that we can address these issues that in some institutions these programs are not penetrating and there are certain peoples who are excluded. The whole risk assessment thing is interesting because um, if you're working in the area of forensic psychology, this is basically the major focus of attention. And the problem is that until very recently, the risk assessment instruments did not take into account environmental issues like support in the community, release plans, and so on. That's only just changing, but as I've been around the world, a lot of correction systems haven't caught up. They're still using assessment system based on the individual outside of the context in which that individual is going to live in the future. And so if you're doing a risk assessment, it's my view that ethically you have a duty to work out a plan which will protect that individual from getting into difficulty. So you have the other ethical duty to show how you can reduce that risk by going to those kind of protective factors that uh, I was talking about. Those things are in the mix. They're just starting to happen but they're not happening uniformly across the country or across the world. And this focus on violence is problematic because, you said, it leaves out a whole spectrum of individuals who are otherwise um, not accessing services. But you should look at what's happening in the general community, how hard it is to assess services for individuals, for example, who have teenagers with mental health problems. Now, if any of you in the audience have this, I suggest that probably many of you find you're not going to access the service till it reaches crisis point. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, you have to tell the therapist that adolescent's going to commit suicide or be violent. And that's the point at which the system will react. I've been out for two years, and I obviously have issues if I continue to go back to prison. And I still haven't received help from you. So it is a very long and grueling process. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it really is getting to this issue, how you access health services and mental health services from the time that you first present with symptoms. And if we're dealing with people who are seriously mentally ill, it takes far too long. One of the good things that's happened in BC is that the psychiatric, forensic psychiatric hospital has actually devised a way where they can actually transfer people from provincial institutions within two or three days. This is absolutely vital, because we can have services, but if they're not available to people who are acutely ill within two or three days, that's too long. But very often, you're actually waiting months. So people need, managers need to focus on how you can actually provide services quickly to people who are acutely mentally ill. And this requires a change in the way you look at the way institutions are managed. And this is starting, as I, I sort of plugged the forensic mental health system in BC, it is actually very well managed. And uh, we need to see this going across the country. Thank you, Sam. Okay, you've been very patient. Well, hi. Um, I, um, thank you very much, um, Simon. Um, I have enjoyed a lot of what you've said. And, you know, you're absolutely right when you're talking about things involving social networks and um, uh, how uh, family development and uh, things are factors. Um, as well, uh, this gentleman here, you're right too, yes. Um, I'm a, uh, an offender, I have a criminal record. And you know, I um, uh, lived a, a somewhat sane life for much of my life, but I fell into something called substance abuse. And when I came here tonight, it was because I understood that this was a community forum. And having been uh, in an intensive um, uh, program for treatment in the last, uh, I began treatment in uh, 2006. Uh, I uh, went to a treatment center after being arrested. Um, had nothing to do with uh, 
corrections, you're, you're absolutely right. If you fall into any kind of correctional situation, you likely won't get help. Um, however, I, I worked for a health authority, so I was very privileged. And um, my treatment was incentive-based. And yes, I went to prison, but I never got any help there either. Um, and I currently, I report on probation. I've never been offered any treatment. And I've been to more than one probation officer. I had to report daily, in person, every single day to New West until I had a, a judge say that I did not have to report every day. These were for all intoxicating um, offenses involving alcohol. My question to, I guess, the panel and the community is, is do you guys have any idea how many things happen in the justice system that just have to do with people getting help for addiction? Because when I was in jail, 97% of the people that I was in there with had a substance abuse problem. I lived three, four blocks from Hastings and Maine. I've completed the admission interlock program. I'm sober. And between 2006 in February and 2009 in April, I had been through seven detoxes, five treatment centers, two day treatments, and then I went to, this was, I grew up in New West, I lived in New West, this is where I used, this is where I drank, this is where I got arrested. I'm sober, I'm not using drugs. I lived in Belkin House, in a transitional recovery place, because that is the only place I can stay safe. Everyone in my family has an addiction problem. It's not safe for me to go home. And when I left the final place that I went to, the place that really changed my life, was a recovery house for women. And it was in New West. And I can honestly say that I never would have had the chance to get any of this treatment, probably outside of the day treatment, which was you know, uh, offered. Um, but most of it was paid for privately. Uh, through my employer, and um, I honestly believe that uh, people, um, if you're listening, I've met a lot of people who are criminals, uh, like all of my old friends I had to give up, uh, and I know a lot of people that um, uh, could have benefited uh, and not died, and probably a lot of my friends will still continue in their addiction, but it's just nice to know that you guys be aware that Many of the mental health issues that you're dealing with, they are poly addiction or alcoholism or whatever, and that, but that makes the mental illness, if it's organic or head injury or all that, that makes it a hundred times worse. People thought that I was seriously bipolar, but they, that was at work, but the police knew that I was a piss tank. So I probably did appear bipolar, but the thing is, is nobody knew because the, ex the, the problem was accentuated by my alcoholism. Thank God I got the help I got. I got my job back, but I have a criminal record. I should not have to end up with a criminal record when I have a mental disorder. I worked for the same employer 21 years. So next month I'm applying for a sentence reduction and I think that this is another avenue that people who are offenders uh, with substance abuse problems should look at and this avenue should definitely be open to them. You know, um, New Esport certainly knew that I had a, a drinking problem. A lot of it was my associates too and you know, my, my living situation. I still don't have stable housing. But the only thing is, is I feel like I don't want to drink anymore. I feel like I don't want to hang out with the same people. And the reason is, is because I was exposed to enough treatment that I got used to not being drunk or, or uh, under the influence of a chemical all the time. I got used to it because I had so much treatment. Okay, let's, uh, thank you. It's, uh, is there a panelist who'd like to respond to? Yeah.
you know, the, the data are really clear. About 50% of individuals who come into uh, CSC, I can't speak for the provincial system, don't think it'd be much different, but 50% have a substance abuse problem uh, that goes beyond, you know, social drinking. About 80% of those with a mental disorder uh, have a comorbid substance abuse problem, often polysubstance abuse. Uh, one of the things that CSC has actually done quite well with is we have a variety of substance abuse programs that many individuals are expected to complete as part of their correctional plan. By and large, these were designed, and, and we have outcome data showing they're effective, they were designed for individuals who are in the great mass of individuals who come to prison without a mental disorder, um, and they, they do quite well at those. Um, our challenge is we have to translate some of those programs for a special needs populations. And we've made some good efforts of that locally. Uh, we're just now getting some national assistance in developing it. For instance, our individuals with um, cognitive impairment, uh, most of the standard programming is just so far beyond them, they're just never going to latch onto it. But if we get translated down to their learning style and ability, they can actually do quite well in it. Uh, but there's no question if you could eliminate substance abuse, uh, you'd probably eliminate a large percentage of most criminality. Uh, just add something to that? Please do. Yeah. Yeah, just, I think actually that even underestimates the issue. If you look at the people who are charged uh, under the criminal code coming into the BC justice system, which is something like six or seven hundred thousand, you'd find um, one third of those individuals have a substance abuse problem. Twenty-four percent have a mental health and a substance abuse problem. We're well over half now. If you go into provincial jails anywhere in North America, the figure is ninety percent have a substance abuse problem. Within CSC, studies show individuals actually uh, who have major mental disorder also have not only a substance abuse disorder but other mental disorders <laughs> and neurocognitive impairments. But when you look at the figures, for all major mental disorders, the substance abuse rate is stable at around 80%. So this is a major issue. This is something we need to be focusing on. And what do we do? Well, we have a drug court and then some places set up a mental health court or some places have a community court. The idea that you actually should have an integrated approach seems to have passed people by. Uh, in the United States, it makes no sense to me where they have many mental health courts and drug courts to be treating those populations entirely separately because they're overlapping populations. But this is developed primarily because of the way funding takes place south of the border. Money is given to set up uh, courts, and that tends to happen in Canada, that money is available for pilot projects, for new things, rather than actually going for really major things, <laughs> where you have to really put out a lot of money at the front end of the system. And it, it's about choices. What do we spend money on? Uh, I was thinking of a comparison, which I heard on uh, the radio this morning. Uh, this is not an anti-Olympic statement, so nothing against the Olympics at all, but just out of interest, I totted up Howard's uh, list of expenditures for a, up to a five-year program, they came out roughly $47 million. Canada spent $120 million to get more medals at the Olympic Games. And that's not mentioning the billion dollars on security and all the rest of it. Now, I'm not degrading the Olympics, but just this is a choice that people make as to what we spend money on. And the problem is that mental health is an ongoing thing. Curing substance abuse is an ongoing thing. It's not dramatic. It's not over in two weeks with the flag going up on the pole. <laughs> but uh, we really have to change the way we think about these things and, and uh, put the money up front. And over 15, 20 years, society will see a major dividend. There'll be a reduction in the need for prisons. There'll be much less suffering. But someone has to have the courage to make that choice and to make expenditures which are not going to show a payoff within four or five years before the next election. And that's difficult, I realize. Thank you, Simon. Simon for Prime Minister. Yeah. Uh, I 
to vote for him twice. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a question, Lori? Uh, Come on. Thank you. Question? Anybody take that up? Well, I think part of it is it's a program that should be in the schools. And for example, at, at the university level, I find a, a very good way of introducing students to some of the issues faced by consumers or survivors is to invite a group of them to come in. And one of the things that they do in the class is they will actually have five people reading different stories at the same time and say, well, that's what it's like to have schizophrenia. And that kind of message gets across very well to uh, uh, students. Uh, I think it's also important that we don't use language which is demeaning and stigmatizing. I don't like the word schizophrenic, you know, someone with pneumonia is not pneumonic. <laughs> uh, why do we have to label people? Another issue is the presentation in the media, uh, one of my students years ago did a review of cartoons and saw that the word crazy, loco, psycho was used like 10,000 times uh, you know, within a year of watching cartoons. So the average child is developing that kind of attitude. Look at Hollywood and the kind of films that are produced. Um, the severely mentally ill are either objects of fun or ridicule or they're extremely dangerous. Uh, and actually some of the comedy in Hollywood come uh, look at, for example, me, myself and Irene, Jim Carrey, a Canadian actor. Um, that is so stigmatizing about the nature of schizophrenia that you've got large mass audience going to that coming out with this idea. So how can we change that? Well, one is actually getting people to talk to each other. Actually, people connect with each other so they can actually talk to people who've been through these experiences. That's changes things when people can actually connect and see they're human beings, they're not statistics or images in the media or on the internet or whatever, they're actually sitting in the room. Uh, that's done at a local level and it is very successful it requires a lot of effort and school programs are one good way to do this. Thank you. Yeah. You have a result? I think it's a, it's a start to see people as human beings. 
but it requires many other things as well. It requires an understanding. For example, one of the things we know is that individuals who are the victims of crime, which are committed by people with mental disorder, suffer a great deal more trauma for a variety of reasons because they don't understand why that person may go through a different system or be treated differently and there's no interaction. So one of the things society has to do is actually put a lot of money into helping people deal with the trauma and as part of that program, they're taught about the nature of the mental disorder and the problems the individual who victimized them had. Now someone mentioned the issue of the Greyhound bus in Winnipeg and Mr. Vincent Lee and the reaction. And it's quite significant that everyone on that bus was traumatized. There were students on that bus who couldn't do their exams. And one of the things I pushed with the Ministry of you know, Department of Justice not very successfully, is that actually we should be providing services to victims on an ongoing basis. So if those individuals on the bus had people actually explain the nature of schizophrenia, uh, this individual, he didn't concoct this story to escape criminal responsibility. He actually had a long history of mental illness and he'd been allowed to walk out of an institution in Ontario. And because of Canada's multi-jurisdictions, once you leave the jurisdiction of one province, on health, it's not like criminal justice, no one follows you. So uh, having people come and explain that to the people on that bus and to deal with their trauma, I think that trauma is going to be a major issue for those individuals. This is very important that we actually pay individuals to counsel uh, people who have been victimized and be told, well, this is the nature of the individual who victimized you, uh, what's the nature of schizophrenia, for example, or bipolar disorder, whatever, and then that actually creates some type of healing uh, for those individuals. But it, it is very difficult to get that introduced into programs. One of the things I've argued is victim impact statements, for example, in general, should be used as a means of getting the state to provide services not just going through victim's compensation, which is often a torturous process, but actually looking at those victim impact statements, seeing the effect, and then someone coming and saying, look, we're not going to force services on you, but it looks like you've suffered a certain amount of trauma. Would you like to be linked up to these services? So I think that that's one of the ways uh, you know, that you could have dealt with the Vincent Lee situation. Thank you. One of the things I would just comment on there, I've not had as much success with educating people and making a difference. Uh, the only time I've had really powerful success is inviting someone in and meeting their enemy, right? Having someone come into the institution, sit down with a group of offenders. I used to do this, I worked largely with sex offenders. Is there a scarier group of individuals in the world? And after a half hour, an hour of sitting there and chatting, the universal reaction was, but they're so normal, right? And isn't that what the breaking down the stigma is all about? I mean, we have uh, two self-proclaimed offenders in there. God knows how many others we have. I dare say none of you could have picked them out by looking around the room. And yet, if I ask you to imagine an offender who you will have to meet in five minutes, uh, I bet these are not the images you'll have in mind you'll have all sorts of other images. So I agree with Simon, uh, they, it's a multifaceted thing, but until you're actually exposed to the thing you fear, it's really difficult to reduce the fear. Sorry, Rob, go ahead. No, please, no, there's somebody else with a comment. Yeah. An example of that is, does anybody in this room know what a private home placement is? Okay, that's not very many people. And it amazes me to think that when a guy's getting close to the gates from a minimum institution or wherever and they're re putting a release plan together, that the community doesn't, I didn't know what a private home placement was. Anybody? 
somebody I spoke to didn't know. And this is an opportunity where the community can open their door to allow an offender to live in a family setting and assist and help. And as you will learn, they're just normal people that made a mistake and or <coughs> some other issues. But the point is, the community is not aware of so many, 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 many things. And if the community would be aware of the cost of keeping people in jail, as opposed to prevention and keeping them in the community, at, at a, they would be astounded. I know you can find, read research and find the information, but the community needs more awareness of this. If a guy is leaving the institution, going to the community, there is a system set up where they can go out on an ETA. And that's where you go out with someone on a supervised outing, per se. But the outing, the, there's not enough of that happening so that the, the offender inside get, gets more community awareness, gets more networking happening. They go from the institution to the one location with no stops in between. Well, what's that got to do with community when you're driving in a car from point A to B? They're missing the whole concept of the, the ETA going out for that visit and learning about the community is complete. So there's some changes that could be done and there should be more community awareness. And I know the community would step up to the plate if they had more knowledge. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, we're at the end of our time here, but um, Howard, did you have any closing thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, 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 yes, Rob, I do. Okay, good. <laughs> Could you just summarize the entire three hours? <laughs> yes. Um, thank, thank you. Um, I, I actually uh, didn't know that I was going to have any concluding thoughts. And so, and then I was thinking, okay, so I'll have some, so I made some notes. And then I changed what I wanted to say throughout the discussion as, as it progressed. So this will be even more disjointed than the first presentation um, because it, it's sort of just a reaction to, to all. Um, actually, I'm quite heartened by, by the discussion. Um, it, it's quite an enlightened discussion, and uh, it makes me very hopeful. Um, Karen earlier said something about being an optimist, and I think you have to be an optimist to, to be in corrections, particularly to make it a career. Um, and I applaud the, the members of our audience who, who disclose their own personal interactions with the... Uh, with the correctional system and other systems. Um, they're not often kind systems, and uh, prison is not a kind uh, place. Um, in fact, prisons are, 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 are pretty brutal places for the, for the most part. Um, they're brutal in an emotional sense. They're deadening. Um, they're not places that value a lot of emotion and a lot of tenderness, um, and the kinds of things that we take for granted is just a decent human interaction. Uh, prisons become artificial places, and um, it's very hard to reach out for help. It's very hard to receive help. It's often very hard to give help. Um, in spite of all that, it's, it's amazing to me the things that happen every day um, in the thousands and thousands and thousands of interactions between our correctional staff, the people who we've entrusted with that work, um, and the people that they are providing services to. There, there, there are, there are re remarkable things that happen. Um, then they shouldn't be remarkable, and I guess that's where my frustration comes in. They, 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 if, if that was truly our intent to build a correctional system um, that offers hope and, 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 and is really focused on people functioning as well as they can possibly function um, in freedom in the community, then those kinds of things that I'm thinking of shouldn't be remarkable, they should be commonplace. Um, and so that brings me to, to uh, I guess, move the conversation, and that is recognize that corrections is corrections. Corrections is the back end of a system. It's the back end of our criminal justice system. I don't mean that in any kind of a disrespectful way, but, it, but, it's, but it's, 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 it's when nothing else has worked. And it represents failure, frankly, often. It represents failure of other systems and other interventions, and, 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 and it represents often hopelessness, not hopefulness. And um, I think we need to recognize that that's what the Correctional Service of Canada is dealing with. And so when I hear the discussion about the need to focus on prevention and integration and move beyond prison walls and, and, and get things right in the community first, or as right as we can 
make it, I'm, I'm actually very hopeful because it says to me that there is energy and acceptance for the notion of an integrated strategy, a strategy of dealing with mental health issues that would not at the, at the first opportunity criminalize those mental health behaviors, but recognize that in fact we are dealing with something different that's not essentially criminal, that is essentially health driven. Um, I look forward to a world one day where I guess we won't talk about mnemonics or schizophrenics, but we'll talk about people that are well and not so well and talk about ways to help people who aren't so well get well-er. Um, <laughs> the, 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 this, of course, will require um, a shift in not only thinking, but a shift in resources. Um, we talked a little bit about the political dynamic of that. But we have to remember that um, our criminal justice system should not be our first response to social disorder, social issues, social disorganization. It should be our last response. And the first response have to be all of those other things that we know that are important, um, that we know they're important about communities. And um, so it's not a matter of a, you know, there was one slide that I had that had a whole list of things that could be elements of a national integrated strategy for mental health and corrections. But I would encourage you, if you're thinking about that slide or that list, to not think about those things as discrete, you know, things that you can check off, but to think about those things really as something far more organic and far more integrated, um, and that deals with people as people and not just as somebody's problem or, or one issue, uh, you know, one system's responsibility. Because if we don't do that, we're going to continue, I think, in this episodic, idiosyncratic response. Uh, where, you know, we talked about circles of support. Um, in most COSA initiatives that I'm aware of are still project funded. Um, they're, they're not, they're, they're, I, don't, I don't know what the funding status is here, but, you know, it, 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 it actually makes my head explode when I think about the number of pilot projects that I've personally been involved in that have been, you know, written up as best practices and, uh, and then we pilot fund something else and then we project fund something else. And Karen's correct. The, the intermediate mental health capacity that I spoke of in my presentation has been accepted. It's a key part of the Correctional Services of Canada's mental health strategy. But you know, that's the good news. The bad news is that there's two pilot projects that have been proposed. One of them wasn't funded. The other one will be funded. Surprise, surprise, it's in British Columbia. Um, now, you know, the, 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 this, this, the, 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 this actually doesn't bode well for the Correctional Service of Canada, if all of the positive experience and all of the good initiative happens out here, uh, what, what are we to do in the rest of the country? So this notion about, you know, the, 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 without focusing on individuals and their needs and not necessarily s seeing it through the lens of the criminal justice system, I think we're going to be stuck with having arguments about whether we, we, we spend more on security or more on uh, more on health, and really the issue is how to get these things dealt with outside of the prison walls, how to get them dealt with before people are in conflict with the law, or if it's after they get into conflict with the law, how to do, um, how to make sure that health issues are treated as health issues and not essentially criminal issues. Um, Rob, I, I, I believe me, I could go on. Um, and, and, and there was, you know, I have notes to back it up, but um, I'll, I just want to, I, I, I will end, and I want to thank you for you and the, and the other organizers and um, uh, encourage you all to keep, the, uh, to keep the dialogue going. So thank you, Howard, and uh, let's thank our keynote speaker.